was living in a convent next to a Brooklyn construction site, noticed the coarse language of the workers and decided to spend some time with them to correct their ways. She decided she would take her lunch, sit with the workers, and talk with them. She put her sandwich in a brown bag and walked over to the spot where the men were eating. She walked up to the group with a big smile and said, Do you men know Jesus Christ? They shook their heads and looked at each other. One of the workers looked up into the steelwork and yelled, Anybody up there know Jesus Christ? One of the steel workers yelled down, Why? The worker yelled back, His wife's here with his lunch. <laughs> I usually read a scripture that the message is taken from. This morning I'm not going to do that because the message is taken from Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8. So unless you want to sit here for a while, I'm going to skip reading those, but I'd like to encourage you to read the book of Judges. The book of Judges is just as it says. As you read this book, you find a consistent theme or a consistent pattern where Israel becomes disobedient to God and, their, and then their enemies come and take them captive. They repent, ask God to forgive them. God sends a leader which leads them out of captivity. They rejoice, they move on in their life. But the problem is, the problem that you'll find as you read this book, Everything I just listed out starts all over again. They go through the cycle again, and again, and again. But you know, this is such a basic lesson for us to learn. That you sin, you're unfaithful to God, you suffer consequences. When you repent, you turn back to God, you will find God's blessings on your life. Now to end the book of Judges, the last verse says this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, as I read that scripture again, I thought, man... I think I'm living in that country right now. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There's no rule of law. Nothing. In other words, it was just plain chaos in the land of Israel. And it's in this kind of setting that we find the story of Gideon taking place. To get a good picture of this story, I want to point out that Israel was in a bad way because of their sin. They lived in fear. The Midianites and the Amalekites would wait for Israel to plant their crops. Crops would grow. They'd get them ready. It's time for harvest. And then the Midianites and the Amalekites would come in full force steal the crops, steal everything that they wanted, and then they'd destroy the rest. So we're told Israel was greatly impoverished. And if you can imagine, everything that you grew, everything that you depended on, everything that you relied on was taken away from you. You have absolutely nothing. If the people of Israel were to get any of the harvest, they had to do it in secret. And Gideon was found threshing wheat in what was known as a wine press. Any of you know what a wine press is? Yes. Some of you do. He was threshing wheat in a wine press because he was hiding from the enemy and he was hoping to keep some of the crop that he had harvested. But that's the story. That's how it's like for this nation. That's how they were living at this time. Gideon wasn't a very popular guy. The Midianites 
Amalekites were angry with him. The Amalekites were angry with him. His own family was angry with him. But God had spoke to him to do something. God spoke to him to tear down the altar of Baal that his father had in his house, or right there. And then to cut down the wooden image beside it. And Gideon took ten men with him. They tore down the altar. They tore down the image that was there also. But you know, Gideon, well, he was afraid to do it during the daytime, so they went at nighttime. And they did all of this. But when morning time came, his family found out about it, the town folks found out about it. Everyone wanted to kill Gideon. A really popular guy, right? Everyone wants you dead. An angel of the Lord comes, sits in a tree next to where Gideon is working, and the angel says this, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Here's a guy that's not loved by anyone, in fact, he's hated by everyone, and the angel comes and says, You mighty man of valor. A guy that's hiding from his enemies. Now, would any of us call somebody that's hiding a man of God? Yes. I wouldn't. But here's Gideon's response. He says, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of the miracles that our fathers have talked about? God has forsaken us and put us right in the hands of our enemies. Again, I want to ask you, does that sound like a man of valor? <laughs> you know, they're having such an interesting conversation back and forth between God and between the angel and Gideon. You know, I, I, I just couldn't help but chuckle. God. Do you really want me to believe that you're calling me a man of valor when all of this is happening? First, the comment, you mighty man of valor. We know Gideon is afraid of his family. He's afraid of the Midianites. He's afraid of the Amalekites. He's hiding just to do his work. And that's the kind of guy you're calling a mighty man of valor. Now, if it was me, Gideon is not the one I would choose to be in charge of an army to defend me. And then to hear how he talked back to the angel? If you were working for me and you're talking back for, to me like that, you would be trapped. Right? I'm looking at a couple right now. I've got a few in here. You don't want to talk back to me like that. And then right after all that was said, God said, Go with this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Go figure. So let's stop here for a minute. I want you to understand something. God wants you. God wants you. I don't care what your shortcomings are. I don't care if things aren't going the way that you think they should be going. I don't care if you're blaming God for all of the problems in your life. God still wants you. And I want us to get it through our, pardon the expression, but our thick skulls to understand that it doesn't matter who you are, God wants you on his team. We come up with all kinds of excuses. We come up with all kinds of reasons that God can't use us. 
But put aside all those reasons, put aside all of those excuses, and understand that God wants you. Now, the next comment Gideon makes is this. God, how do you think I can save Israel? My family is the weakest in all the land. And not only that, but I am the least in my whole family. Gideon's a frustrated guy. <laughs> Things weren't going his way. His way. He was a victim of his circumstances. He felt like he had nothing to do, nothing to offer, nothing to help with. He didn't have the skills. He didn't have the talent to turn things around. And then again, we hear the comment, God, you've got the wrong guy. I'm sure I've made that comment a time or two. God, I know there's somebody else out there that can do this a whole lot better than I can. And you chose me? Well, I think most of us can relate to that. I think most of us can relate to Gideon and the things that he's gone through in his life. Let me ask you this question. Are you bitter because... God hasn't done things the way you thought he would, or the way you think he should do it? Are you disappointed? Are you afraid? Like Gideon, we can give all kinds of reasons, all kinds of excuses, when God speaks to your heart and you want to say, uh, God, that's not me. That's not meant for me to do something like that. I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm not a man of valor. I'm just an ordinary guy. Bitterness and disappointment will push you back down on the wine press. Will push you back down where you're hiding. You'll become isolated. You'll become discouraged. I can tell you to keep your eyes on God and don't get distracted by the battles, the trials that you face in life. But think about it. What was it that began to transform this coward named Gideon? And I'm going to tell you what began the transformation in here. The thing that transformed Gideon from a coward, from somebody that was hiding from the enemy, was a personal encounter with God. If you're going through situations bigger than what you can handle, you need to have an encounter with God to overcome whatever you're facing. Whether it be doubt, whether it be fear, whether it be guilt, whether it be inadequacy, feeling like you just can't do that because that's not you. Now, let's take another look at Gideon. It was one thing to have an encounter with God in secret, yet another to stand up in public. Gideon began to make a difference at home when he tore down the idol, even though he's, he was fearful of his own family, Gideon took a stand. Gideon had chosen his mind when God has spoke to his heart, I'm going to make a difference in my life, and I am going to take a stand. I remember back when People were trying to break the four-minute mile. Trying to break that record. People said it can't be done. There's no way it can happen. In fact, at the time that they were trying this, this, is, this went on for many, many years. As I was reading, I found that they had tried every way that they could to get somebody to break that four-minute mile including having wild animals chase the runners. <laughs> wow. I also 
read where they were feeding them tiger's milk to increase their agility, to give them more strength. And the experts said it was physically impossible to run faster than four minutes in one mile. They said our bone structure was all wrong. The wind resistance was too great. Our lung power was inadequate. And then one day, one human being proved that the doctors, the trainers, the experts were all wrong. A guy named Roger Bannister in 1954 beat that record. And the following year, 300 more people beat that record. The thing that set Roger Bannister up was in 1952, he ran a race, and he lost that race. And he had determined in himself that he was not going to lose another race like that. He trained harder, he went out and worked harder, he did strength training, he did everything that he could think of. Two years later, he was the first to break that record. Even though he was told it was impossible, Nothing is impossible when God's involved. You can live a victorious life. You don't always have to live a life defeated. You can be an overcomer. You can get out of that white press and get out into the open and take a stand for God. And live your life for the world to see. I want people to know that I'm a Christian. I want people to know that I'm willing to take a stand for God. And when you do that, it will give others the courage to do it also. If you want to be a leader, take a stand. Last week I shared with you about taking a step out of the boat. Taking a stand. When Gideon had an encounter with God, it gave him the courage to take a stand. So Gideon called for all the men of Israel to come and take a stand with him. And the men responded, and as they came, Gideon began to get nervous. It was kind of like, God, you really meant what you said. If I took a stand, you would be by my side. If I took a stand, you would lead me, you would guide me, you would go before me, and others would come also. But Gideon was nervous because the enemy had 135,000 men, and Gideon only had 32,000 men to stand with him. Although those men came and responded to the call, Gideon began to get nervous. And then Gideon, as we have seen, Gideon has this conversation back and forth with God. He has another conversation with God. He says, God, I'll tell you what. Anyone ever do that? I, I can tell probably all of you. God, I tell you what. If this is really what you want me to do, you need to give me a sign. So here's what I'm going to do. Now, this is Gideon talking. God, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to put out a sheep's fleece on the ground tonight. And if the ground is dry and the fleece is wet, I'll know that you're talking to me. I'll know it's your will for me to do this. So guess what? He does that. He wakes up the next morning. Everything is just perfect. Just as he had asked God to do it, then guess what? God, you know, I think, you know, I need to do this again. Let's reverse that. God's, you know, he's like, God, let's do this one more time. If the ground is wet, and the fleece is dry, then I'll know I'm supposed to do what you're talking to me to do. 
Whoever do that, come on. Uh -huh. You can relate with Ken in here. And after Gideon did this twice, he figured out that God, God must be a little serious here. Gideon wanted to be completely sure that he was in the will of God. Gideon wanted to be completely sure that he was hearing the voice of God. Now, Gideon knows for certain now that God told him he would lead the army to victory. And that he was to lead this army. And Gideon called for all the men of Israel to join him in this challenge. 32,000 men showed up. Wouldn't it be cool right here in Garberville to put a challenge out for all God's people to show up? You have 32,000 show up. Amen. Boy, it's pretty weak out there. That would be so cool. You'd be so excited, so energized, so encouraged. You wouldn't know what to do. Gideon's now ready to go, and God says, hang on just a minute, Gideon. Not quite so fast. You've got too many men. And Gideon's thinking, how can you have too many? So tell them that whoever is afraid to go home. How many of you, how many of you know how many went home that day? 22,000 of them go home. Instantly left. And God says, you've still got too many. And the final total of men chosen to go to battle was 300. Now, I don't know if you've done the math on that, but 300 versus 135,000, I don't think that's very good odds. And if I was living in the natural, I would be going, God, what, do you, what did you get me into? Again, he wasn't in the natural. He knew what God was going to do. He knew what God spoke to his heart to do. Now at this point, I'm not sure Gideon was too convinced that God had it just right. So God told him, Gideon, I want you to go down to the enemy's camp. Take so-and-so with you. I can't remember his name, but take him with you. Go down and I want you to spy on the enemy's camp. camp. And I want you just to listen in on the conversation that's going on down there. So they went down to the enemy's camp and as they're listening to a couple of the Midianites talk. They're telling each other about a dream that they had. And the interpretation of the dream was simply this. Gideon and his army is going to whip us. Gideon and his army is going to beat us. And after Gideon heard this, he was convinced that God was with him. You know, as I look at Gideon's life, it took an awful lot to convince him. And it looked like every turn that he took, he needed convincing of what God was speaking to his heart to do. Friends, this morning I encourage you, rather than having to be convinced every time you turn around, listen to the voice of God. When God speaks, he means what he's saying. When God says, I want you to go, I want you to go, you don't need to put a fleece out. Just go do it. So then Gideon goes back to where his men were camped. The 300 of them were camped and says, I want you to get up. We're going to battle. God has already won the battle for us. You know, I get so excited when I hear that. God has already won the battle for us. We might sit and complain about everything that's going on around us, all the problems in life, but I want you, if you turn your hearts to God and you have an encounter with God, you will understand that God has already fought those battles for you. 
when Gideon took his 300 men, they took three groups of 100 each. And he told them what to do. And he said, we're going to blow our trumpets. And then say, for the Lord and for Gideon. And when they did that, what happened? The whole army. The whole 135,000 army ran. They fled. That's what obedience to God will do for you. When you're obedient to what God speaks to your heart to do, the enemy has to flee. The enemy has to go. Now, at this time, you can call Gideon a man of valor. In the beginning, when God called Gideon a mighty man of valor, he wasn't speaking for how he was right then. But God was speaking to a man that he saw in his heart would become a mighty man of valor. When we look at people, we see them for what they are right now. We see people with all their faults, with all the problems that they have. But God sees them for who they can become. God sees them for who they can become. God is looking for men. He's looking for women who will become Gideons. He's looking for men and women of valor. Men and women who are willing to overcome their personal circumstances. Who are willing to step out and do great things for God. So I want to ask you this question this morning. Is that you this morning? Are you willing to overcome your shortfalls and become a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor? God can use ordinary people to do whatever He wants done. He can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I ask you that same question again. Is that you this morning? Do you want to be an extraordinary person? Do you want to be a mighty man or woman of valor in God's kingdom? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for your word. Lord, here we have an example of an individual that I've used this morning by the name of Gideon. You called him a mighty man of valor before he was a mighty man of valor. God, as I look out over this congregation, I don't see through my natural eyes. I see through my spiritual eyes. Men and women that want to go forward in you, that want to grow in you, that want to become mighty men and women of valor in your kingdom. God, I thank you for that. Father, I pray that they be encouraged in you and that they be challenged in you to do that very thing.